It's Rogers TV. The opinions expressed in the following programs are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Well, hello there. This week I'm told tonight, we go to the puppets. That's how bad we're going. We don't even have enough money to afford a sock puppet. Don't look at me, Jeremy. You know it's true. Keith, Keith, I can't even turn my hand that way. Keith, get up. I'll just tell you. I'll just, yeah, there you go. I'll tell you, and you tell Keith over there. Oh, 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 my neck. Okay, that's enough of this foolishness. This week on the show, look, I can't even come up with a good accent. This week on the show, we have Ed the Sock. Ed the Sock's going to talk about his career in much music, Music Nation, and a lot, lot more. Why am I telling Jeremy? <laughs> hey, look at the crowd. Where's the crowd? They're there. Ah! Enjoy! Play the intro music, please! Ed, welcome to the show. It's been a long time coming, I feel, because I've been watching you on Much Music for a while. I don't think a 10-year-old should be watching Ed the Soccer on Much Music. Oh, but, but you'd be surprised how many did. <laughs> Oh, yes. You'd be surprised how many. Uh, part of my legacy is the number of people who come up to me and say, you know, my parents told me not to watch you, but I did anyway. I was the forbidden fruit. Yes, that, that is for sure. I would be like, you know, if it was a sick day and you're staying home and you're at your grandmother's house, I'm like, okay, there's Rick. There's, you know, there's another BJ. Okay, and we're doing music videos. That's all cool. And the next minute it's like, Here's a oh, and then go oh, here. Here's a sock puppet. He'll uh, he'll like the sock puppet. She leaves the room, and I'm like, um, uh, Nan, no, that's that's not the right sock puppet. <laughs> well, it, it, what do you mean? What was the what is the right sock puppet exactly? <laughs> uh, I don't know, like one that wasn't uh, like cursing or swearing or like telling me off. It was like, well, I was, couldn't. I mean, I never, I never swore because of uh, my stuff on music. I mean, I swore on my late night show. Yes, but that exactly. one's Friday nights at 11.30, Sundays at 11.30. There's no way you were up. And if you were, someone should have I, called Children's Aid. I, I, listen, there's a lot of times that my, my brother was babysitting. Maybe not the best babysitter. Let's just put or, it there. or maybe the best babysitter. Yeah, uh, Tell me how you got into broadcasting. Um, I uh, started out uh, on a, a small uh, cable 10 station. They don't really have cable 10 stations anymore. Those were channels that cable companies had to by law provide for the community so you could come in and do a tv show um now it wasn't as easy as that you had to pass some criteria um but uh it was a great place for people to learn because you know it's not the same on youtube for example because there's nobody there to give you any potential guidance or, or help um and also nobody there to indicate whether anything you're saying is of any interest to anyone other than you uh, whereas uh, Cable 10, there had to be some kind of interest to somebody other than you. Anyway, I started on the smallest Cable 10 station in Toronto. Uh, the show just built. Uh, in those days, being viral meant that uh, people passed around VHS tapes of your show to each other, which is what happened. And eventually I was uh, on uh, all, like all the major, in all the major cities of uh, Canada uh, at 1130 on Friday nights. Um, and then from there, uh, CBC and City TV came to me and said, we want you to bring your show to us. I knew, <laughs> knew that on, City, on CBC, I'd last about three weeks, if that. So I uh, went to City TV and they said, uh, we want you on much music at the same time. And I was like, all right, fine. Didn't really want to do much music at the time, but it was all right, let's give it a shot. And, uh, you know, then 14 years passed and it was... Uh, on CTV and much music all that time. So why were like I, I agree with you with the CBC landscape because I, I feel the same way where it's like okay if I want to do kind of an edgier show maybe not the CBC route but I want to ask you like why were you a little bit hesitant for much music? Because I never watched it. Because <laughs> I didn't care about music videos. I didn't care about popular music. Um, and uh, you know it seemed to me to be a bit goofy um you know it seemed like all the vjs were kind of like either zany or really kind of dull 
Um, and again, I didn't really watch it, so my view wasn't exactly well informed. But my my main goal was my late night show. That was my big deal. Much music was well. I hadn't really thought about throwing the videos, but eh, what the hell? We'll give it a shot. Um, and I happened to start there just as there was a changing of the guard. The uh, guy who founded the channel, basically John Martin, may he rest in peace. Um, he uh, it was replaced by Denise Bonlin, who had been on uh, the new music, the TV show, and earned uh, for somehow earned the right to to run the channel, and she wanted to change the channel <laughs> to make it a little less goofy, a little more relevant. Um, and at the time, I thought she was insane. Um, but slow, and I think, and she used to say that uh, she used to almost get lead poisoning because with me, because every time I was on the air, she would chew through pencils, worried about what I was going to say. Um, but uh, we came to uh, respect and like each other. And I saw that her direction for the channel was, in fact, the smartest one, and one where I fit in the best. Can you remember your most memorable one and your most embarrassing one? Where like it might not be something humiliating, but you're kind of like, okay, if I had the time back, like might have would have did that differently. Um, no, to the second one, okay. I never regretted anything that I did. Well, that's good. Um, that's good. I didn't go in like I didn't go into it to be a. I yeah. went into it just to have fun, and like they either went along with it or they didn't. Um, most memorable is hard. Um, Singing with Beyonce, singing with Willie Nelson, they were very, you know, that's memorable. Yeah. Um, uh, making uh, Chris Martin from Coldplay run around the second floor balcony while I hummed the Benny Hill theme, for those who remember Benny Hill, that was fun. Uh, riding in a, a limousine for the afternoon with uh, Gene Simmons, um, that was memorable. Uh, Christina Aguilera was always fun. I hosted her, uh, her, her, first and only Canadian national press conference. And when uh, reporters asked questions I thought were stupid, I told them to shut up and sit down. Um, that was a good, and she was trying not to laugh, which was great. Um, who else did, I mean, Avril Lavigne was always fun. I interviewed Avril, Avril and Christina both are examples of people who nobody else wanted to interview them because they weren't famous yet. Okay. Like, Christina walked across the street from the record company uh, office that was across from Much with just one person. There was like no, nobody not recognized her. At that point, she'd just been on the Mickey Mouse Club as a kid and had a song on the Mulan soundtrack. Nobody had ever heard of her. Um, and uh, same with uh, Avril. Her ab album hadn't even dropped yet. And, you know, there were some people who only wanted to talk to the biggest names. I was the other way around. I was like, just I'll talk. I, I want some of these these people who are new and who may never actually break big. Yeah. I want to give them the same VJ interview experience as anybody gets. They deserve the same chance. So I would interview people who didn't uh, who, who who didn't rate as far as some people are concerned, and then they blew up, and then they never forgot who it was that interviewed them first. Because I used to always argue we should spend we should do at least one show where we focus on artists who aren't signed to a record label yet. And they, Much Music refused. They said they would only talk to artists who were signed by a major record label. And I said, well, what's the point? They're already on their way. We have yeah. the opportunity to help people who need, who, you know, who need the opportunity. And they said, well, this one individual, this stupid moron pr producer uh, who was in charge of this said, uh, well, how do we say yes to, to some and no to others? And I said, by saying yes to some and no to others, it's called leadership and management. You do it sometimes. Yeah. But, in, but rather than having to say yes to some and no to others, they said no to everyone. Yeah. Um, and that's why when I started New Music Nation, which is about to become newmusicnow.ca, the whole idea was create a much music-like vibe, but focus only on undiscovered artists people with small record labels, people with no record label, uh, people who are really, really talented, making really good videos and great music, but can't seem to get any attention outside of their immediate peer group. I remember um, kind of discovering Our Lady Peace and a whole bunch of like punk bands, I guess, like, you know, Simple Plan, all through kind of much music. And I think if I had the power, now I'm still young, but if I had the power to change the remote or turn off the TV and be like, now for me, I don't think I'd be listening to these bands. Like I made a joke to my friend maybe a few years ago that I was like, 
would have not been in the third eye blind, would have not been into Our Lady Peace. Uh, maybe Blink-182 a bit, but not plus 44, but only for there's a station that shows all this kind of music and not in a circular motion, just randomly. I was like, all right, I'll watch it. Yeah, well, uh, now, you know, I mean, there's never going to be an experience like much music was. Because yeah. in those days, we had common experiences because we had narrower choices. You know, if you wanted to watch music videos, uh, when, whenever you wanted to watch them, like flip on the TV, other stations would have like half hour shows. But if you wanted to watch music videos and wanted to be to see the place that got, you know, uh, the music videos first or whatever, it was only much music. There was only one place you could go. So you would sit there and, yeah, watch a video that uh, was new or maybe hadn't caught your attention yet because you knew something would be coming up next that probably would. So you'd sit through it and then discover, hey, you know what? Not so bad. Yeah. Um, but now people have the power, as I said, to just cut away anything uh, that they either don't like or think they might not like or, in fact, not even know they're cutting away things they might like because how do you know? People don't know. It's always, you know, when they say uh, uh, we have to give the people what they want. Let's ask. Let's ask the public what they want to yeah. see. The public doesn't know. Yeah. Okay. The truth is, the public knows what it likes only when it sees it. When you ask the public what they like, you're trailing behind everybody else because all they're going to tell you is they're only going to reference things they've already seen. So how do you give them? So how do things like uh, Better Call Saul, Breaking Bad, uh, Game of Thrones? Uh, things which were very different than what was on TV at the time. How does that happen if you decide that you're going to go through focus groups where yeah. people have, they don't have the new stuff to compare the old stuff to, so they stick to the old stuff. So you keep giving them retreads of the same old shit. Like I used to enjoy the VJs. I enjoy the music. Now there's segments there, like, you know, uh, much on demand or when people would come in to Toronto and you'd see them and like, you're looking outside the back. Now we've had this conversation with Strombo and Campanelli and it's just like craziness. It's crazy pandemonium, especially when you had like uh, your much music video awards, all that. So it's like really peak, but then slowly over time. And I don't know if they agree with me on this and maybe you don't either, but it's just when you started to put in like TV shows, like I'll be a sucker and say, I watched S club seven on much. It was okay. Doesn't mean <laughs> that was for me, uh, but I did watch it. But then Ain't over no time, party like an S club party. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but over time, it was just like, then they had like the a VJ search, which is like a reality TV show. Now it's like ridiculousness gets replayed a lot of times in Seinfeld. Like I know it's over time, but I think the real implement to me was like, okay, we're doing a VJ search. I remember being in like maybe high school and someone in my class wanted to partake in this. I was like, oh, that's, that's a good way to kind of get your foot in the door into journalism, I guess. But I was like, it sounds like just another reality TV show. Which, you know, funny thing, I actually was the first person to, su to, to suggest doing the VJ search as a reality show. Yeah. Except not. Oh, sorry, not, sorry. No, no. They made it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They made it. I wasn't involved in it. I had quit, I think, by then. Yeah. Uh, I had quit much by then, I think. And they made it because the people who were left only knew how to make. Um, there's a reason I quit much music. And yeah, you're right. Over time, what happened was they management changed, Denise left, and they started playing more and more shows. And they would create shows. Like there was a show called, uh, it's supposed to be called In Your Space, which yeah. plays on the, the phrase in your face, right? But they decided you had to put the word much in everything. So they called it much in your space, loses the connection to in your face. Like yeah. it's not clever anymore. And it, it was just copying uh, MTV shows. And that's because a new person took over and she told me our viewers are stupid and just want, so we're only going to give them. Um, and I was like, that's not true. Our viewers are not stupid. I deal with viewers on uh, email and in person when they come to the building all the time. They are, they're smarter than the average bear. They, they were clever people. And the problem was that the people in management were themselves stupid. And you know, stupid people think they're smart. So they think that other people must be less smart than them. Um, so the, I was also told that our the viewers um, didn't remember anything that happened more than three months ago. So don't reference anything that happened more than three months ago because they're stupid. And at that time, 
I had just debuted a new series called Smart Ass, The Ed the Sock Report. And the most recent episode, the second one, was called What's Wrong with Hip Hop? And because that's when everyone's criticizing hip hop for, having, for its treatment of women and, and all this other. Um, and in that video, in that show, we traced uh, hip hop back to griots in Africa uh, hundreds of years ago and traced uh, you know, rap music and music talking about you know, their conditions and stuff all the way back from there to through the 70s, 60s, 70s to today. And the show debuted with the highest numbers they'd had in six months. And then the rerun, also higher numbers than other things they'd had in six months. The show was a hit. And so when they told me that people aren't interested in anything that happened more than three months ago, I said, um, but smart ass uh, went back to like the 18th century or something. Yeah. And the numbers were huge. And they just said, yeah, nobody's interested in that. See. And like, um, what? I said, no, did you hear me? It had higher numbers than anything else. Pause. Yeah, nobody is interested in that. So what up? Like I'm talking, I'm talking to trees. Yeah. I'm talking to people who aren't even listening. It's like, I'm telling you what you're saying is not right. We have empirical proof that what you're saying isn't true. And all you keep repeating is the same old stupid thing that has been proven not to be true. Do you wonder why I quit that stupid place? But I mean, Canadian entertainment today, it's sad. Like Canadian television, very, very sad. Um, it used to be, first of all, used to be you had licenses for your channels, right? So much music had a music license. Sports Network had a sports license. Um, and then the CRTC a few years ago said, well, you guys are having trouble making money, so you can run anything you want. Yeah, that's and dangerous. And so every channel had CSI reruns. Um, and uh, so everyone's in, everyone's in everyone else's playground. Yeah. Um, and then the CRTC said that the money that you have to spend as a network you can spend it all in prime time as opposed to spreading it out during the day. The best shows, the shows we remember that felt personal to us, that felt like they were made by real people, those were shows that were lower budgeted. Now, lower budgeted also meant, in most cases, uh, they weren't as easy to syndicate, to sell around the world and make your money back on. Uh, yeah. So CRTC said, go ahead, uh, big networks, put all your money into prime time. So they put all their money into prime time dramas, cops, lawyers, medical. Uh, that shows that they can think they can sell around the world. Now, I understand there's an economic reason for it, but it also means that all of those other smaller shows that uh, we, we grew up with and that we felt connected to, they don't, they're not made anymore. Um, and I don't know anybody who's still in the Canadian TV business who likes it. Yeah. They endure it, but it's mostly a horrible, horrible place to be. No, no, I agree. I mean, like you turn on any TV station now, that's like kind of, like Canada related or like, you know, up here. And it is just a lot of like, I will make the joke um, that, you know, if I turn on CBC, there once was a time that it was like, I felt like Newfoundlanders were running the CBC because they used to have a promo video. There was Republican Doyle, there's son of a critch, there's all this stuff. But I'm just like, at the same time, I'm like, but there are a lot of the same shows. And like, now it's trying to like, I get you on a minority audience to like kind of feel included. But I mean, like, there's a way that you can make them feel included without explicitly being like, here's your show. This one's for you. This is your show. It's like, no, just make a well, show. Well, I mean, they, they yeah. did that. They did a good job with Kim's Convenience because I think anybody who uh, who came to this country or whose grandparents came to this country or whatever could relate. Didn't matter. You'd yeah. have to be from Korea to understand that immigrant experience. It was very broad. And then the people who produced it, not CBC, but the people who produced it, bet. Uh, and that was the end of that show. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's less now than it used to be. When I was growing up, CBC wasn't shows reflecting how Canadians lived. It was telling us how we were supposed to. Yeah. You know, it was telling us the, what we were supposed to think. It's not so much that now. Um, I think CBC has a tough mandate because their mandate is not what CTV or Chorus is. They're supposed to create programming that reflects Canada. Um, yeah. And that is a tougher mandate. And so sometimes, yeah, it seems the stuff is parochial, little mosque on the prairie and crap like that. It seems forced, but they've, they've gotten better in many ways. Um, the thing is, you'll, you'll, what you see on CBC and anywhere else is typically reflective of who the person is that gave the green light for, yeah. for the show. Because these shows tend to reflect the people who are in development uh, giving the okay, not necessarily the audience. It's difficult to get stuff greenlit 
in this country. I know people who have had a lot of success who uh, can't get things greenlit. Because Canada, see, in the States, you notice how you'll see na- the same names for 30 years? Yes. Um, uh, right. On TV and behind the scenes? That's because in the States, they're like, hey, you know, this actor or this character has been very popular on this show. That show's ended now, but people still have a relationship with that character or actor. Let's take advantage of that equity and put give them another show because people have a relationship with them. Friends, in Canada, Joey, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, 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 was Cheers, then Frasier. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, there's uh, there, there's a lot, and and uh, you get actors uh, getting other spinoffs. You know, they're not playing the same character, but they've been popular in other things um, because people have a relationship with them. Yeah. Now, especially when there's so much choice. In order to cut through the, the, the crap and the noise, you got to have some, something that somebody's interested in. Somebody rela- It's like Facebook. You ever go back, you ever think of somebody you went to school with and you like, go check them out on Facebook to see what the hell they're up to these days. And if they sound interesting or whatever, you'll say hello. Um, that's like television. Yeah. It's like you see, oh, this actor or this character is on a new TV show. Hmm, let's see what they're up to these days. Yeah. And uh, you go and you check it out. And if it's good, you'll stay. Um, but in Canada, it's very much, well, you've had your chance now. Let's give somebody else their chance. Yeah. And that's why it's not a business here. You, you kind of made me feel sad when you said about the Facebook thing where it's like, you know, if you go back and if someone wants to check in on you because you're interesting, uh, I'm looking at my Facebook like, ugh, it looks like it's, I'm actually seeing spider webs. I don't think anyone's checking in on me. No. That's because uh, <laughs> it's an old example. People don't know <laughs> to check out Facebook anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, my Instagram's doing no better. I'm looking at it and I'm like, I've sent a couple messages. Oh, no, no one cares. That's okay, though. I care. That's the important part. I care. Uh, I, I care about your sadness. Oh, th- thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's be depressed together. Do you remember the first time that you were ever really nervous or shaken by an experience? I think actually like shaken would be uh, Woodstock 99. Okay. Cause that it went, it went to hell in a handbasket while I was live on the air with Suk Yin. We, well, I looked, I looked around and I said, Suk Yin, this is going to turn into Lord of the Flies. Um, I, I predicted it. I could just feel it in the air. And when it all went and people were tearing things apart, someone, people flipped a car over, set it on fire. Um, uh, the police had to come and push uh, the, the people back uh, several hundred feet. And there was a line of cops and then the, the attendees who had had enough because they'd been ripped off and overheated all weekend. They were lighting fires in garbage cans and hitting the garbage cans like some kind of tribal crap. Um, and uh, uh, I came across a woman who, a young woman who had been uh, sexually assaulted. Um, and I, I got her into the, uh, there was a private area that was security covered for all the media people. And we had our own medical area. And I had to fight with a security guard to get her into the medical area to get treatment because she didn't have a wristband. Um, it was uh, seeing all that, that that was shaken. Talking to celebrity, what the hell would I be shaken for? What do I give yeah, a yeah. damn? I mean, my worst yeah. interviews ever was that Vanilla Ice um, and Anthony Kiedis from Red Hot Chili Peppers. Two of the worst interviews I ever had. Two of the biggest. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, because the, the next random one here was going to be like, who is a celebrity that you would have liked to interview? That's a good I mean, one. You know who I'm thinking about? You know who I would really like to have met? Uh, Howard Stern. That, yeah, that's a good one. Because uh, he and I have, uh, there's a lot of things he says, which um, are very much uh, similar to me. We have uh, similarities that I won't even go into. Um, but I respect a guy who took on the FCC and did his thing and created represent, representation for people uh, in ways that the, the polite society didn't like. Um, he, broke, he broke down doors. Uh, yeah. And uh, then he evolved into the person he is now, who's a great celebrity interviewer, has a very different point of view on things, but is still funny and edgy. Um, he's a guy who's really evolved as a public figure. So, I mean, I'd love to talk to him, but, uh, you know, that, 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 uh, he never leaves his house, so that won't happen. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned Howard, because I remember when we were in um, Algonquin for like broadcasting, they showed us like his kind of, it's, I guess it was a movie on his career. Oh, and, private uh, parts. Yeah. And they like, they showed you like how, I don't remember all of it, to be honest, but like, I guess there was one time he was in Detroit. They wanted to be like a country radio 
and he was like not about it and then his idol didn't like him at all told him to go go himself and then i remember watching that and being like very like motivated to be like okay just because no one really gets you or likes you doesn't mean you can't make it and then when i went to our program director and i was like what about if i did this show he's like yeah you're not doing that i'm like what the did we just watch this guy's video for that more or less challenged the system and you're basically being like yeah we wouldn't do anything like that today i'm like what did you just show 20 odd students that this guy did and now you're like nah don't do it (laughs) yeah well uh the truth is that most of the people who are gatekeepers these days um really shouldn't be gatekeepers uh they're inexperienced or they're mbas and uh like business people and they don't understand that like business people want to minimize risk that's their thing but in creative industries if you want to succeed see you got to take calculated risks um so i've talked to a lot of people who are the ones who who give the green light or not and my thought is who the are you What, what qualifies you to make these decisions for for an entire network for an entire country to see like give, I, I give me something in my conversation with you that lets me think okay there's a reason you're making decisions and i i, I very very rarely uh, get that feeling do you think i should be making decisions yeah fine okay thanks is man. there any last words that you have for people like out there that could be in broadcasting or journalism and or even just a youtube channel something inspirational for them or is it more or less just like go yourself i want it all (laughs) no i would say that anybody who who wants to uh be a a a performer so to speak you know a broadcaster uh or on youtube my my thought to you is this um do it for fun don't try to make it uh, a paying uh career do it for fun find something else find the second thing that you most like to do in life and pursue that and then keep this stuff uh, as uh, something that is very special to you, a creative outlet for you, something that doesn't get ruined by uh, trying so hard to get into a business that is hard to do, trying so hard to attract an audience online, which is hard to do. Uh, you just get heartbreak that way. Don't do that. Continue to enjoy and embrace your creative side by not trying to, to make a fortune at it because it's very hard to do. Uh, do the other thing and make this the thing that uh, gives your, you know, gives your life wings. I like that. That's solid. I, I, I feel like I've already failed at that, but I, I'm doing my best. Oh. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Ed the Sock for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying thank you for listening, and good night. I'm Justice. And I'm Nia. And we believe dreams fuel revolutions. That's why we're engaging with Canadian icons.